Why don't you grab your Bible and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 42, as we continue verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the scriptures. Isaiah 42, last week we got to dive into the kind of the fun, uh, more joyous section, if you would, of Isaiah. And, um, and I say fun or joyous because the first part is pretty heavy. Woe unto the rebellious children of Israel, Isaiah the prophet says. Um, and, um, and that's what they were, and that's what we are, by the way. We're rebellious children of Israel, uh, just like they were rebellious children. Remember, we've been, as Gentiles, the church grafted into the vine, uh, Romans chapter 11 tells us. And so we have to take these blessings and the curses with you know, Israel. I always find it interesting how um, some people, they read the Old Testament and all the curses they like to apply to the Jews, but all the blessings they like to apply to uh, the church. Uh, in fact, some of your Bibles like mine, an old you know, King James cameo from Cambridge, uh, and, you know, the <clears throat> titles on the pages, you know, you'll, you'll see curses for the children of Israel, blessings for the church. Like in the Old Testament, you'll see that in their little writing. Those aren't inspired, by the way. Those are just little titles given to us by the translator, um, but <clears throat> misguided. Uh, and so we have to understand the blessings and the curses kind of go hand in hand. But we're gonna see how these blessings that we're gonna read about here in chapter 42 really do point us to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, this little chapter, chapter 42, breaks down nicely into four main sections. We have the coming Messiah uh, right here in verses one through four. We have the confirmation by God, verses five, um, really through uh, nine. And then we have the command to worship uh, given to us here just in, um, in verses 10 through 12, and then the ca- catastrophic destruction uh, in verses 13 to the end. And so we'll kind of see that tonight. First of all, the coming Messiah, we looked at that really on Sunday. Uh, we saw all these attributes of Jesus, eight that we looked at on Sunday. Let's read that once again. Isaiah chapter 42, verse one. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. So number one, the coming Messiah and those eight attributes. If you missed that on Sunday, you can catch up online uh, the teaching there, Isaiah chapter 42 verses one through four. And that's the first section of this chapter, just a description of the attributes of Jesus that we are to behold. And remember when we behold Jesus, when we look at Jesus, we go from glory to greater glory as we look upon him, we are changed. And that's a good bit of news for you and me because we need to be changed. We don't wanna stay the way we are. Um, And we wanna become more like him. And so uh, that's why it's beneficial to look at Jesus. And so we saw that on Sunday. And then that brings us to the second section, the confirmation by God confirmation of who God is and, and the, the Messiah that he would send would all be confirmed. And we're gonna see that here. We pick it up in verse five. It says, and thus saith God, the Lord that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. First of all, you know, Isaiah's reminding us of the mighty creative ability of God. And I love that because, man, when you look at creation, you just can't help but to stand in awe uh, of the Lord, you know, and, um, and that's kind of where we begin this. You know, he, he's the creator and he gave all humanity breath and spirit. It all came from God. You know, when you can consider the power and greatness of the one who created the universe, um, and all the inhabitants, every square inch of this planet. I mean, what an amazing thing to think that God just spoke the sun into existence. You know, um, if you even think about our own solar system, um, you know, uh, 
if you, if you consider just the dynamics of our solar system and our galaxy and <clears throat> the, the, the context of all that, you know, at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, that's pretty fast, um, sunlight takes eight minutes to reach the earth. From the, from the time the light of the sun burns, it takes eight minutes. That's how far we are, if you do the math, eight minutes to reach the earth. That same light from our sun takes five more hours to reach our furthest planet, which is Pluto most of the time. Uh, you say most of the time, yeah, the, the two outer planets tend to crisscross uh, every several decades or whatever. So some people think it's Pluto, but it's actually not always Pluto. But forget that for a second, five hours for our sunlight to reach the furthest out planet, which is Pluto. That's a long, long time, 186,000 miles per, spec, per second, that's, that's, uh, that's something. After the light of the sun leaves our solar system, however, that same sunlight must travel for four years and four months to reach the next star in the universe. That, uh, that's a distance of 40 trillion uh, kilometers. Um, that's just mere shouting distance in the universe. Do you understand that? Uh, 40 trillion kilometers is just a stone's throw. Because, you know, the sun, our sun, re resides in, in our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way galaxy. And, and um, it's shaped like a flying saucer, you know, the bulge in the middle and kind of flat out on the outside. Um, and that's the shape of our galaxy. And we're somewhere, our sun is roughly three quarters of the way out uh, to the edge of the galaxy. And that's where we're positioned in the Milky Way galaxy. To get a feel for that distance of, of where our sun sits, if our solar system were one inch across, just one, if our whole solar system, you know, from the sun uh, out to the furthest planet, you know, Pluto or whatever, if that was all just, our little solar system was one inch in distance. The distance from there to the center of the Milky Way galaxy would be 379 miles. If it was just represented by one, one inch, you'd have to go like up to BC, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia to, to reach with one inch. That's the size of our you know, sources, you'd have to go all the way out to get to, the, to Vancouver, BC. That's, a, that's just a sense of the, the distance and the space. Yet the Milky Way is, is um, but one of roughly one trillion galaxies in the universe, one, one trillion galaxies. Uh, and ours is, when you think about how big our galaxy is, that, that's something. Um, you know, uh, the astronomer, Alan Sandage says, galaxy are as to astronomy what atoms are to physics. <laughs> kind of puts it in perspective. There are 20 galaxies in what is called our local group of galaxies. The, the next sort of grouping is the universe uh, of the universe is called a super cluster of galaxies. Within our super cluster, the nearest cluster of galaxies is called Virgo, uh, and it's 50 million light years away. Um, a light year is, a, is the distance light travels in one year. To get a feel for the distance of one light year, uh, if you drove your car at 55 miles per hour, it would take you 12.2 12 12 million years <clears throat> to travel one light year. Well, that's a pretty long time, 12.2 million years to travel that distance at 55 miles an hour. Astronomers estimate that the distance across the universe is roughly 40 billion light years and that there are roughly 100 billion, billion trillion stars. Um, and the Lord Almighty is the creator of all that that we just talked about. Not a bad day's work. Uh, let there be light, Brrr, the sun pops out there. That, that's the God that Isaiah is talking about. Um, you know, you feel pretty puny when you start thinking about God and his ability of creation. And by the way, that's why I think the secularist, uh, you know, ground zero or the front, you know, trenches of that battle is creation. There's a reason why, you know, a lot of the secularists and uh, atheists and what have you, they desperately want to defend evolution. Because apart from evolution, there's no real, um, you know, uh, I, I would say that even with evolution, there's no real honest uh, guess about how things really began. You know, origins, you know, Darwin, Darwinian evolution and stuff is something that people have settled in to sort of think that it's all right, but it's total fantasy. And in billions and billions of years, uh, it went from basically prebiotic goo to you. 
uh, you know, and, and all the beauty and, and structure and intellect and sequence and order uh, just shook up after billions of years and by an accidental set of circumstances, it suddenly went to total intricacy and technology and all that stuff. That, that's just far-fetched to think you could put a bunch of stuff in a big box, shake it up and open the box and you got a Rolex watch. Um, that, that's pretty much what they say happened. Uh, it'd be more likely, by the way, for you to put a, a, just a giant box, a little shoebox of watch parts, uh, and you throw it in a box and you just shake it for a billion years. How long would it take for you to shake that box and have the Rolex watch? You open up, wow, it just kind of came together. Well, the odds of that happening are way better than for what happened according to evolution. <clears throat> so that's ground zero. That's why we as Christians, uh, I should say, you know, there are some goofy Christians, I have to say, my brothers, who uh, are saying theistic evolution. Uh, God created, and they're trying to acquiesce to the secularist world, saying God created the world through an evolutionary process. Stupid, don't believe that. You're, you're believing in a fantasy, the shaking of the box thing. Uh, nope, just take the Bible. I've always found the Bible very rewarding if you just take it at face value. Um, I take the Bible literally when it's meant to be taken literally. There are times where the Bible leaves us the indication this is a figurative you know, picture or stuff like that. But whenever the Bible is speaking literally of things, we should take them literally, like creation. So it says that God, the Lord, Jehovah is the word there, stretched them out. And we talked about this, how the universe is expanding and tensor cal calculus, how they've been able to calculate how there is kind of an uncurling or an unfolding of the universe that seems to be happen happening. The same language of the Bible, which I think is interesting, the stretching out and the unrolling of the universe that Isaiah speaks of. And so we, we first see the impressiveness of God as a creator here, but then he goes on in verse six. He says, I, the Lord, that's Jehovah, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. He's speaking now to the Jews here, Isaiah is saying, the Lord has called thee, the Jews, in righteousness and will hold their hand. Man, uh, you know, when you think about the Jews and their history, um, the Lord has held their hand through thick and thin. Uh, you know, it's amazing that they're even still a nation. Um, the fact that they still exist is incredible because there's been so many times in history where evil demonic people have tried to exterminate the whole, you know, Jewish people. Um, you know, it's interesting because some people talk about racism today and, and they'll talk about, you know, slavery and racism, uh, African-American uh, racism and stuff, and, and it's real and it's something that we need to fight against, for sure. But it's interesting to me that the Jews are sort of being, there's a lot of racism against the Jews today in America too. We're seeing that around the whole world, uh, racism against the Jews. But what's the difference between, you know, racism and, uh, against like say the African-American um, versus the racism that we're seeing against the Jew? Um, we've never really seen a movement uh, in the world to entirely exterminate the entire black population. Thank the Lord for that. But I have to tell you, uh, just to take things as seriously as we can and to understand there's a real demonic thing going out there with racism against Jews, uh, you know, the whole anti-Semitic movement that's out there today. There's been several moves to try to wipe out the entire race. You know, en enslaving a, a nation of people is bad enough. But the Jews have been the target, not just to make them slaves, but to say, we're gonna wipe them out entirely. And that was, you know, the final solution of Adolf Hitler is to totally wipe out. That's why he killed 6 million Jews in gas chambers of the concentration camps. Um, you know, so before we get too, you know, um, divided over what's happening in racism in America, we, we need to kind of see that God's chosen people, the Jews are also, very subject to some real racism around the world. I, I find it interesting that we get sort of fixated on one problem and then we forget some of the other problems around the world too. And sometimes those problems can be worse than the ones we're fixating on. Um, and uh, I think the, it's all about the narrative. It's who's controlling the microphone, who's got the voice, who's the, who's the ones uh, controlling the media. And it just becomes this big thing. 
But man, know your history. Know what happened to the Jews throughout the ages. If it wasn't Hitler, it was Antiochus Epiphanes in 170s you know, BC. If it wasn't Antiochus, it was Pharaoh who tried to exterminate Jews or Herod the Great during the time of Jesus where um, they, you know, he killed Jewish babies. Like who does that? Just goes and slaughters all the male Jewish babies. Herod the Great did that. Um, you know, we can talk about um, you know, the Emperor Hadrian and the Roman Empire and the persecution of the Jews. We could talk about all the way back, you know, um, to the time of Esther, where Haman uh, was the guy who tried to exterminate the Jews uh, as an entire race. This has happened many, many times in our world's history, and yet today we see this anti-Semitism on the rise again, with no apparent reason why. Like, why is there anti-Semitism? I'll tell you the answer. They're God's chosen people. And, um, and the Lord says to them here in Isaiah, this, if I were a Jewish person, I'd be hanging on to this verse. The Lord says, listen, I will hold your hand through all the things you're basically going through. He says that, the Lord, I have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people and, and for a light of the Gentiles. Aren't you glad about that, Gentile people? that the Lord used, how, how did the Jews become alike? You know, there in Genesis 12, when Abraham was called by God and he said, I will make of thee, Abraham, a mighty nation and you will be a blessing to all the people of the world. All the nations of the world will be, will be blessed by you and your seed, Abraham. And you know, there's so many ways the Jews have blessed the world, even though they're hated by the world. What's amazing, they've brought more science and medical technology and health and all kinds of invention and, and uh, creativity to the world. It's not even funny. Uh, when you look at the arts and, and comedians and the, the things the Jews have offered to the world is pretty amazing. But not, an, not any of those things are the light to the Gentiles that's being talked about here. When, when the Bible here in Isaiah talks about the light unto the Gentiles, we're talking about the light of the world, Jesus Christ, who was a Jew. Don't forget that Jesus was a Jew. And he was the one who would be the light that would, be, that would shine. Jesus stood there on the Temple Mount on the Festival of Lights. You know when they had Hanukkah and they celebrated the, the lights? Jesus said on that celebration, he says, I am the light of the world. Um, and he not was, just, not was only a light to the Jews, he was a light to us as well. Man, I'll tell you, we're living in dark days. Uh, and uh, if I weren't a believer, if I didn't have Jesus, I'd be pretty depressed right now. But because we walk not in the darkness, but we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another as Christians. And we also know Jesus and we have the hope of heaven. Um, we are children of the light. We're not in the darkness. And that's why I hope you're always keeping your light on. I hope you're looking to the light, Jesus Christ, because otherwise you'll find yourself getting real depressed as you see you know, explosions rocking Lebanon. Did anybody see the news yesterday? a giant explosion. Initially, they came out saying, fireworks, you know, it was a firework factory. Uh, no, it was, a, it was a giant. Some have said it's the biggest explosion on the earth since Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, that, that actually destroyed much of Beirut yesterday. I'll be talking about that tomorrow or Friday on our prophecy update. What's the significance of the giant explosion in Lebanon? Um, I, I think it is uh, important, and we'll be talking about that. And who, wh where did it come from? Why, did, why was there almost a nuclear level explosion in the city of Lebanon uh, yesterday? Um, I think there's some reasons, and there's definitely some blame and anger, and people are trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, I think it all has to do with Bible prophecy, by the way. So we'll talk about that uh, Friday. But Man, we're living in these dark days. I'm so thankful that Jesus is the light of the world and he's not just the light to the Jews. Now, by the way, you remember how I told you the Jews in the New Testament thought that Gentiles were just fuel for the fire of hell? I talked about that on Sunday. And the Jews were sort of hated by the, uh, pardon me, the Gentiles were hated by the Jews in many ways uh, in the New Testament times. But an insightful man who was sensitive to the Holy Spirit uh, brought this little verse up that we just read, this part about the, Jew, the, the, the Jews would be a light for the Gentiles. And it's there, in fact, by the way, in Luke chapter two, let me just read it to you. It says in Luke chapter two, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was 
Simeon. And the same man was a just and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. Who is the consolation of Israel? Jesus, he's waiting for the Messiah. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Again, we talked about that last week. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's an empowering. Well, what did the Holy Spirit empower Simeon to do? Well, check this out. The Holy Spirit was upon him and the Holy Spirit revealed unto him that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ, the Messiah. And so then he's just hanging out one day and the same Holy Spirit came to him in, and, and drew him to the temple. So he just gets up one morning and he feels the Lord telling him to go to the temple there in Jerusalem. So he goes into the temple and when the parents of Jesus brought in the baby Jesus uh, to do for him after the custom of the law, then Simeon took up the baby in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph, his mother, marveled at the things which Simeon said of him. <laughs> what did, what, Mary's going, huh, what, or, what did he just say? That, that this one would be the savior of the world and that, that he'd, he'd be a light unto the Gentiles? Where in the world did he get that? Isaiah chapter 42. Simeon must have been a man of the scriptures um, and also a man of the Holy Spirit. He was a guy who was sensitive. I love that old guy. He says, okay, Lord, I can die now. I've seen the, you know, you told me that I would not see death until I see the Christ, the Messiah. And he's just there in the temple and he holds this baby. He's like, okay, check. Saw the baby Jesus, now I'm going to heaven. Like, I, I just love this guy who knew the scriptures. He said, this is the light of the Gentiles that Isaiah was talking about there in Isaiah chapter 42. So Jesus would be the fulfillment of, of what this chapter is saying. And that's part of the confirmation of the Messiah, of who he would be through these Old Testament scriptures. Don't forget, Jesus would be fulfilling hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament. And it should have been verified and confirmable by the Jews when Jesus came, everything that he did. Born of a virgin, riding on a colt of a donkey, coming into Jerusalem on the very day that he rode in. And they should have known the day by Daniel chapter nine. Uh, but they also should have known when Simeon declares, this is the light of the Gentiles. This is all fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus fulfilled more than 300 very specific prophecies of the Old Testament when he came and appeared as a man on the earth. Um, and this is one of those, that he was the, um, the light of the Gentiles. And what, what else would he do? We'd see confirmation of who the Messiah is, that he'd be light of the Gentiles. Number, verse number seven goes on and it says, to open blind eyes. Did Jesus heal the blind? Yes. To bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Um, you remember the demoniac that was chained and Jesus delivered this guy from demons and then the town people came out and saw him out of the chains and in his right mind and like delivered from prison. Like Jesus did all of the things that the prophet said. And he goes on in verse eight, says, I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah. I am Jehovah, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So the Lord's confirming everything that he's saying. My Messiah is gonna come and he's gonna do all these things. And the Lord says, I am the Lord, I'm Jehovah. Um, don't let anybody take glory for what I have done. It is interesting, the sadness of human nature. You and I have this proclivity to try to take credit for stuff. Um, when really Jesus is the one, the Lord, the Jehovah of heaven is the one who deserves all the glory and all the credit. Um, how are you on that one? Ask yourself that question. Do you ever take credit for the giftings or the talents that you, uh, that you have? I, I, I always kind of used to chuckle a little bit, but the professional athletes on ESPN after a game, I like to thank God for my wonderful talent. You know, like there was this, there was this sort of thing that you had to say if you're a pro athlete, but you kind of got the sense that it, it didn't really come from a place in their heart of total belief. Now, once in a while, an athlete would come along and they'd say it in a way you're like, wait a minute, I think that guy really believes that. And those are the ones you're kind of like, okay, I, I love that, that there's a real humility. And, um, and uh, there's an acknowledging that, that I could do nothing apart from God. 
Um, but you know, there's an old saying, there's no end to what a man or woman can do as long as he doesn't care who gets the credit. Some people are hung up on this one. They, they really desperately wanna get the credit for things. And when you are one who tries to get the credit, you will be defeated. It's disheartening. You'll never get enough credit. But the truth is you didn't deserve any credit to begin with. And if you think you deserve credit, you are misguided. It's just the truth. And, and it's something that's within our human nature to wanna get the pat on the back or get the credit for a, a job well done. Some of you, you know, are frustrated because at work, maybe somebody else got the uh, sort of accolades of others because of something you actually did. You know, and this happens all the time. You know, the manager that stumbles around not knowing what he's doing and the team under the manager is doing all the hard heavy lifting and then the boss comes and says to the manager, you have done a wonderful job. Um, and, and you think, well, that wasn't him, it was us. If he, if he wasn't here, we'd do better. And you can get yourself real bitter. But you gotta remember that there's no stopping what you can do um, as long as you don't care who gets the credit. But I would take it even a step further than that old saying, as long as you care that God gets the credit, that truly all glory for every good thing belongs to the Lord. Um, the Lord says, I'm not gonna share my glory with another. And then he kind of puts on there, neither my praise to graven images. Um, you know, the Jews had that proclivity to sort of create these false idols. Um, remember, you know, there when uh, they were worshiping the golden calf in the Old Testament, and they would say, behold the gods that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, that's exactly what God's saying here, don't do. Don't give credit to other gods for the things that I have done. You might say, well, Brett, we don't give credit to golden calves and gods, but I think sometimes we're our own little gods in our minds. Look what I have done, look what I have accomplished. And, and the Lord says, I'm the one who gets all the credit. All glory and honor and praise belongs to the Lord. Nothing of that belongs to us. Oh Lord, make us a humble people. You know, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up, but let him be the one lifting you up, not you lifting yourself up. Uh, it's a hard one, but it's an important one. The Lord's not gonna give to another the glory that des he deserves. Um, so there you have it. Well, verse nine, behold, the former things are come to pass and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Um, isn't this interesting that the Bible does this, that God does this. I love the way this said, the former things have come to pass and the new things I will declare before they even happen, I'll tell you about them. That's what the Lord's saying. It's called biblical prophecy. <laughs> We're not very good at prophecy. I like some, there's a bunch of, I've over the years made a huge list. Let me give you some of my favorites. The world's worst predictions. King George II said in 1773 that the American colonies had little stomach for the revolution. That was just three years before we actually uh, you know, went to battle and ultimately defeated the, the Brits. Uh, oh, oh, another one, uh, an official of the White Star Line, speaking of the firm's newly built flagship, the Titanic, launched in 1912, declared that the ship was unsinkable. Um, famous prediction that was totally wrong. In 1939, the New York Times said the problem of TV was that people had, had to glue their eyes to a screen and that the average American would never have time for it. <laughs> Bad prediction, especially if they saw screen time today with our little mini screens and all that. Um, an English astronomy professor said in the early 19th century that air travel at high speed would be impossible because passengers would suffocate. Um, that one's actually kind of true. Uh, they make those airplanes so tight, uh, you feel like you're gonna suffocate, and now you gotta wear your mask. So maybe he was right. No, I'm just kidding. No, the, the, the predictions of humanity, goofy, wrong, lame. But the Lord, it's amazing that he declares the beginning from the end, the Bible says. And here the Lord says, the, the, the new things that I do declare, I'll declare them before they even spring up. That's prophecy. And that's one of the reasons why it's so fun to do prophecy updates from, you know, once a month because so much of what we're seeing in the world today are things the Lord spoke of about the last days. Um, and so why not uh, look at what the scriptures say as it relates to the end times. Um, churches that say, oh, we don't do Bible prophecy because it's so divisive and it's, it's you know, confusing and we'll just kind of wait and see how it all pans out. 
That's the wrong attitude. We're supposed to read the Bible. One fourth of the Bible is about prophecy. And you gotta throw out the book of Revelation, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. You gotta throw out all these books of the Bible. And, and really pretty much almost every book has some bit of prophecy in it. Um, you gotta throw out one fourth of the Bible if you're not gonna be into Bible prophecy. So be careful with that attitude. I think that's a wrong attitude to diminish any bit of the word of God. That's why we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. We don't wanna skip over or diminish any section of the word. But all that to say, the Lord is the one who knows the way things are gonna go down and that's why we're gonna talk about it Friday night. Well, then he goes on in verse 10. Now this brings us to the third section, by the way. The first section is, you know, the coming Messiah, number one. Number two, the confirmation by God. He's creator. He knows the beginning from the end. The Messiah would come and he'd, he'd uh, uh, be the light to the Gentiles, open blind eyes, set captives free. Jesus did all those things, confirmed, confirmed, confirmed. But number three on our list, um, we have the command to worship. Because of all the things he's done, we are given that command to worship in verse 10. It says, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth, ye that go down to the sea and all that is, in there, that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rock sing and let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise um, in the islands. Remember the islands we talked about last week? That's the nations of the world. Um, so all the nations. Now what's this thing about Kedar and the rock? Is the Alcatraz uh, gonna be singing praises to the Lord? Well, the, the, the rock there is probably a place called Petra or Selah uh, in the Hebrew Old Testament. And the reason they talk about the uh, villages of Kedar and the inhabitants of the rock or the rock city, Petra, the reason that that would be is, is sort of in the, the mind of the Jew listening in Isaiah's time, it'd be even the people way out there will be singing praises to God. Um, out in Tuleville, out in no man's land, uh, because the, those, uh, those kingdoms were way out there, you know, as far as the Jew would think in that. So it's, it's kind of like saying, man, people are gonna praise the Lord even way out there in Dundee. Uh, you know, or, or out there in Welch's Oregon, you know, like we, we, we kind of think of those as more outlying areas. That's, that's kind of what he's saying here. But it's a command to worship the Lord. You know, he says, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. Are you a worshiper? Are you one who sings praises to the Lord? Or are you one that's a bump on the log during worship? You know, that's one of my biggest concerns. I've got several big concerns during this lockdown of the church and um, again, I, I, I gotta remind you, we're praying. We're praying about when the Lord would have us open the doors here. And we're not really waiting necessarily for a green light uh, from the governor or any of that, truthfully. We're waiting for, for a green light from the Lord. And we've been praying about that. But one of the things that concerns me during this time where you're not able to be in here, and I'm also concerned about this when you're all here, because some of you are great worshipers. Others of you, it's almost like you come in and you sit down and you're sort of here during the worship time and you're just here to wait for the teaching. Okay, let's see when they're done here. We're gonna have a couple songs. Then we're gonna get to the real stuff, the Bible study time. And I'm glad that you're into Bible study, but I hope you're also into worship, uh, singing praises to the Lord because the Bible tells us that we're to um, sing unto the Lord and, and give praise and worship. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. You know, that's something God wants you to be as a worshiper. And I have a hunch that um, the time we spend singing praises to God is time well spent. When we get to heaven, none of us will say, oh, I wish I spent more time playing video games. Or I wish I spent more time, you know, um, uh, you know, watching sports. I bet you when we get to heaven, we're gonna be really glad for the invested time in worship. And I wonder if it'll somehow play out in our ability to worship in the eternal kingdom. Man, when, and whenever you see the throne room of God in the Bible, you see these insightful, extremely intelligent beasts or beings falling down before the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're like singing before the throne of the Lord and it's just day and night for all eternity just because God's glory is so beautiful that people are just worshiping with a passion for all of eternity. 
So I'm just saying, you better get used to it. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, this life is just a little bit of a dress rehearsal uh, for when you get to heaven. And I and, uh, hope, hope you're not a tourist when you get to heaven. Well, what's going on here? I wonder if some of you will chime in. Well, Brett, I don't have a very good voice. Guess what? When you get to heaven, I think you're gonna sound like Pavarotti. You're gonna suddenly be able to sing, maybe like Johnny Cash or somebody that's legit. You'll be able to sing. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a, a real voice when I get to heaven. Uh, but until then, I'm gonna squeak out whatever songs I can and uh, work, work on uh, praise because it's a, it's a good thing to do. And uh, here the Bible commands us, uh, not only in the Psalms do we read that, but here in Isaiah, let, uh, let, let's all sing unto the Lord a new song and praise from the end of the earth, you that go down to the nations is the idea thereof. Well, the command to worship, number three. Number four on our list here in this chapter, the cataclysmic destruction. Um, now he's gonna talk about when the Lord comes and, and the day of the Lord, when he intervenes in this Christ rejecting sinful world. Um, it says in verse 13, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like the man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. What's this thing about a mighty man shall stir up jealousy like a man of war? Um, he's gonna have such warring skills that everybody will wish that they could be as mighty and powerful as him. That's, that's, the, that's kind of the idea there. Nobody will even be close. Um, he says in verse 14, I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman, I will destroy the, and devour at once. Now this is interesting um, because he says, I have refrained myself and have been still. The Lord has been patient. Um, and the big question is, why is the Lord patient? Have you ever found yourself just saying, oh Lord, come quickly. You know, where you're just like, why, why is the Lord coming? Why doesn't he just do it? Why doesn't he rapture his church? Come on, Lord, rapture today. Come on, Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we do feel that. But what is it that makes the Lord delay? Why is he just being still? Is he lazy? Or, you know, that's, that's when you hear people saying, oh, where is the promise of the Lord's coming? You Bible prophecy guys have been talking about the rapture of the church for years. You know, when people criticize us that way, you know what I like to say? You're fulfilling prophecy right now. <laughs> what, what, what prophecy? Well, 2 Peter, check this out. It says this in 2 Peter chapter three, verse three. It says, knowing first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. You know, nothing, nothing's really different. And, uh, and, and some people are saying that today and they're saying, well, sure, we got the coronavirus and we got wars and rumors of wars and we got pestilence and disease and all that stuff. We got issues. But where's the promise of his coming? And they said in the last days, that's what Peter says, they'll say, where is it? And then he says, for this they're willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world then was overflowed with water, perished, speaking of the days of Noah. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved to fire, not a flood, the next time the Lord des destroys the world, it's not gonna be a flood. It's gonna be fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But Peter goes on to say, beloved, be not, not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness or laziness, but he's long suffering. Now here's the answer. This is why the Lord delays and this is why he's being patient. It says right here, he says, he's, he's long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth and the works of therein shall be burned up. You see, Peter tells us the answer of why the Lord seems to delay his coming, but it's not laziness, it's it's patience, long suffering, and he would that none should perish. The Lord is waiting for those last people to be saved that are gonna be saved. 
Sometimes I wonder if on a Sunday morning when I'm inviting people to accept Christ, if that might be the last person on the planet. And then right after we say, amen, boom, rapture of the church. Wouldn't that be great? Never know. But I do think there's a threshold where God's gonna say, time's up. And he knows that day, uh, you know, when he's gonna do that, the, uh, the father in heaven says, you know, says that he knows that day. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, but my father, which is in heaven. So that day's coming and the Lord's being patient because he wants, wants to see people come to know him. Because once that rapture of the church happens, that's not gonna be easy. It's gonna be brutal. And uh, to be saved during that time, well, that's a whole nother story. So here in our text, we have this idea of, um, you know, the Lord, he's reserving himself and he's refraining himself, verse 14, um, and he's gonna come and destroy. Look at verse 15, it goes on, chapter 42 of Isaiah, verse 15. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs. I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and, they, and the crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Who are the ones who are blind? Some of you already know the answer to that, but let's read on. Verse 17, they shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, um, that they say to molten images, you are our gods. Hear ye deaf and look ye blind, that you may see. Don't you love that? What an oxymoron there in verse 18. You know, hear, ye deaf, look, ye blind. That's funny to me. Um, the Lord's saying you're blind, you're, you're deaf, but the idea is he's gonna open up your sight. He's gonna open up your ears. And then he'll say in verse 19, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this, this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are of all snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for a spoil and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. And it is, hath set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him yet he laid it not to heart. Um, the Jewish people were stubborn and rebellious. This is something Isaiah's theme is the rebellious children of Israel. He says that over and over again, woe unto the rebellious children of Israel. Now, the, the good news is um, the Lord's not done with the Jews, even though they are rebellious, even to this day, they're rebellious. And by the way, before we as Gentiles think ourselves all high and mighty, we're rebellious too. You know, we don't have the gods and goddesses of stone that they did necessarily, but we have the same evil and the same entities that are behind those gods and goddesses. We worship those same things. But the Jews, what happened to them? Well, the Lord caused blindness to happen. Um, that's what it says. Be not ignorant of this, uh, you know, Romans eleven twenty five 25 area right there. Uh, the, don't be ignorant that blindness in part has happened to Israel. The Lord has blinded their eyes. Why? Because they were choosing to not see, choosing to not hear. So the Lord says, okay, I'm gonna blind you. And even in the next chapter, we're gonna see that he scatters them all over the world. The diaspora is what it's called. But there's coming a day where he's gonna lift the blindness off their eyes and open up their ears so that they will hear and see who God really is. And there's hope uh, for the Jew. Um, and why did he do this? Because they, they were sinning and they worshiped idols and were stubborn uh, against the Lord. And that's Isaiah pretty much in this last part, calling them out, calling out his own people for their rebellion and stubbornness. Now, before we get too down on the Jews, <clears throat> man, we, we're the same people. We also have that stubborn streak to do our own things and to sin against the Lord. So in chapter 43, we're gonna see this discussion continue about the promise that the Lord has for the Jews. 
It's in chapter 43. He's gonna talk about correction, uh, correcting the Jews, but then also salvation uh, and then destruction for others. So he's gonna kind of sort that out here in chapter 43. It says in verse one, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, another name for Israel, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Um, this is for, for the Jews. The Lord says, I've redeemed thee. How would he redeem the Jews? The same way he redeems you and me, by the blood of the lamb. There's no redemption, there's no salvation, there's no remission of sins apart from the shedding of blood. And Jesus would be the lamb of God that would be slain for the sins of the world. And that's what Isaiah the prophet is talking to about the Jews. This, see, how, see how this is such good news, you know, really? I love this. So he says, I've called thee by name. Is there a time in the New Testament where the Lord says, I call you the church by, by his name? Yes, John chapter 10. The good shepherd knows his sheep and he knows them by name. That's something about God. He knows his people and he knows them well. I love that. Well, verse two, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, the, uh, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Um, you know, this is the Lord saying, I'm gonna protect you even through those dark times. Some people might say, well, that's not very good protection. Six million Jews killed in, out, in, in the you know, concentration camps of Hitler. Um, but you have to understand that the Lord did preserve them and their people. Even though they were hanging by a thread, the Lord protected them. Um, you know, it's interesting because um, uh, th th all of this that has happened to the Jews, the scattering of the Jews all over the world, the regathering of the people into the land of Israel uh, today, it's all evidence of God. In fact, one of the greatest arguments, it was Count von Zinzendorf, who a uh, certain you know, a Prussian king was uh, you know, asking for evidence of a, of, a, of a God. And Count von Zinzendorf said two words, the Jews. That's what he said. And it's true that when you track what has happened to the Jews um, and you see how God has done exactly what he said he would do, um, even to this very day, we're seeing stuff uh, that prophecy told us about, about the Jews. Uh, there's no greater, I think, argument for God's existence, perhaps, than the way he has dealt with the Jews. He goes on in verse three, for I am the Lord, that's Jehovah, thy God, the Holy One of Israel thy savior. I, have, uh, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. Um, boy, there's some interesting things about uh, Sheba or um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, uh, even in our prophecy update and how they're kind of standing with the Jews right now. We'll talk about that on prophecy. Update. There's so much happening right now that the Bible talks about. It's hard to contain myself tonight. Uh, to not just go right into that, but we'll, we'll dive in uh, Friday night. He said, you know, I'm your, your, your God, I'm your savior, I'm the holy one. Uh, and he says in verse four, since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Um, this is God's doing. The amazing regathering of God's people, the Jews, to the land of Israel. You know, if you ever really want to see uh, some of this, you got to kind of dive in. I, I feel like we're too short attention span as people. Um, but um, just seeing the Zionist movement from the, you know, starting Theodore Herzl and, and all the way, you know, to uh, the, you know, the um, May 14th, 1948, when Israel becomes a nation um, and the regathering. This is what the Bible says right here in Isaiah. And there's other passages as well in Ezekiel that very clearly articulate the Lord would scatter the Jews all over the world and they'd be scattered for 2000 years. Now you say, well, big deal. So they regathered. Did you know that's never happened ever in the history of the world for a nation of people to be scattered all over for any real length of time 
only to be brought back 2,000 years later with their same identity. How do the Jews keep their identity being scattered over the world? It's interesting, by trying to keep the Jewish laws. The laws that God gave the Jews sort of kept them sort of as a nation, even though they were scattered all over the world. So when you go to Israel today, man, you see Russian Jews and you see um, you know, uh, Jews from Europe and, and from New York and Philadelphia. And like, it's, it's an amazing thing to see these Jews who were scattered. You know, did you know that even the Hebrew language was lost? They, there was nobody speaking Hebrew. It was like Latin back you know, um, before this guy named Ben Yehuda. He, uh, he, there's a street in Jerusalem named after him because he's the one that sat at his dinner table and said to his family, tonight is the last night you will hear us speak in our native tongue. We shall speak Hebrew from this day forward. And this was in the Zionist movement when the Jews were moving back to Israel and they started speaking Hebrew again and, uh, and largely led by Ben Yehuda, this idea of bringing Hebrew back. And now when you walk into Jerusalem, you hear everybody speaking Hebrew. So you say, well, big deal, they brought back their language. The Bible said that would happen, that they'd be scattered, that their language would be disappeared and it would be revived. Bible predicted all of this. Again, you gotta be a little bit thick to not believe that God knows what he's talking about when it comes to the future, especially when you look at the Jews and Israel. Well, he says the North, the South, East, the West is gonna give up the Jews and they'll come from all over and we've seen that. There's Jews that have piled in. Isn't it interesting that God's doing this while the world is saying, the Jews get out of here. We don't want you here. This is not your land, even though it is on so many levels, but it's God's doing. Well, he says in verse eight of chapter 43, bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations gathered, be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witness that they may be justified or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me, there is no savior. Not only is there no other God, like Isaiah 44 is gonna talk about, but here he says, uh, there's no savior. This is what I was talking about. Not only did the uh, exclusivity of Jesus, you know, remember we were talking about the, the narrow path to salvation, that Jesus is the only way and people get all upset about that. Well, as it turns out, um, that was foretold by Isaiah the prophet. It wasn't just Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the father, but by me. But it was Isaiah that said, the, the, the God of the Jews, Israel said, there, beside me, there will be no savior. Why? Because God became a man, became the lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the world. And beside him, there is no savior. Um, you see, all of the New Testament truths that we know and love were all foretold in the, in the Hebrew Bible. That's how Peter, James, John would later defend what happened when Jesus came. They would say, this is that which the prophet Isaiah spoke of. Um, when Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, when John the Baptist pointed out the Lamb of God, this was the Old Testament fulfillment. And that's why many of the Jews in that day started to believe because they saw in their own writing uh, the gospel unfolding. So there's only one savior. The Jews were called by God to say, testify against this if you don't believe it. That's what he's saying, but believe it. Verse 12, I have declared and have saved, I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day I was, I, was, I am. Uh, yea, before the day was I, am he. Um, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and Chaldeans whose cries in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Um, pause here for a second. So this is an interesting um, mention. Isaiah saying the Lord's gonna you know, be the downfall of Babylon, verse 14. This is a prophetic statement because the Babylonians were pipsqueaks at this time. 
They really weren't much of a world power. But remember Hezekiah was uh, tricked by the Babylonians, that whole story. But the Babylonians, they, they, were, they were gonna be later. Isaiah wrote this around 701 BC. Um, but the Babylonians would attack in 586. Well, that would be the final wave where they'd be destroyed. The Jews would be destroyed in 586. But ultimately the Lord would be the one to do away with the Babylonians as well. And he says, I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the creator, your king. So kings will come and go, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, Alexander the Great, the Greeks, um, all those kingdoms would come and go, but the Lord is reminding them, I'm your king, the Jews king, verse 15. Um, by the way, um, have you noticed the descriptions of, of who God is in this chapter so far? Uh, we see him as the Holy One in verse three. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One. Look at verse 15. I am the Lord your God, you're the Holy One. We see him number one as the Holy One, number two is the, at the Savior, verse three. He says, I am thy Savior. Uh, verse 11, I even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. So we see him as the Holy One, the Savior. Number three, the Redeemer. We see him as Redeemer. Uh, verses 14, um, where it says, uh, thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer. Um, and also verse one, I have redeemed thee and I have called thee by name. So Holy One, Savior, Redeemer, but also Creator. All these attributes, look, verse one, uh, I have, um, uh, I, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee. Verse 15, I am the Holy One, you're the creator of Israel. And um, we see that as his attribute. And then also the king, verse 15, I am the, the Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. All of these attributes and the, just these first 15 verses of uh, uh, chapter 43, Holy One, Savior, Redeemer, Creator, King. Isaiah's just laying it out for the Jews to say, he's God, you're not, be impressed uh, because he does all of these things. So he says, thus saith the Lord, verse 16, which makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the, and the power, they shall lie down together and shall not rise. They are extinct, they are quenched as tow. Of course, speaking of the Jews when they were trapped between Pihiroth and Migdol there as they were departing Egypt um, and they, the Lord made a way into the sea and they crossed over in the chariots and the Pharaoh's army uh, sank down into the sea. Uh, all of what the Lord did. Verse 18, remember ye not the former things which uh, neither consider the, old, the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, ye shall not know it. Um, I will even make a way in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert to drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall for so show forth thy praise. Um, just the Lord in his goodness providing streams in the desert, rivers in the desert. That sounds pretty good to me. Um, by the way, verse 18 is great. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Does the Lord want us to forget about the past and move forward? I think the answer is largely yes. It's interesting how sometimes um, some versions of psychology demand to dig up and drudge up your past and revisit all those painful things and sins that have been committed against you. But, um, but the Bible kind of teaches us something a little different. Um, and, and you can jot this down in your notes, but in Philippians chapter three, verse 13, it says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, listen, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Too many Christians sit around spinning their wheels, looking at the past, failures, mistakes, sins, sins that were committed against them, bitternesses, uh, frustration because they were wronged by some group of people or hurt by someone's things that they said or did to you. And people just get bogged down in that stuff. The Lord says, man, I want you to move forward, run the race. Nobody running a race will stop and go, hey, you, you hurt me. You, you, no, the person who's really in the race is gonna keep running. Forget what's behind you, move on toward the front. Go, move, advance, 
<laughs> Don't get bogged down. Too many people get bogged down in their past and the things that have hurt them. Get up and run. That's what the Lord would say. And that's what he's saying both here in our text, but also in Philippians 3.13, same kind of notion. Um, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old, but let's go, let's go. That's what he's saying. Verse 22, but thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle by thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with the sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve thee with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with uh, money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins, thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. The people, you know, stopped worshiping on the temple, stopped making sacrifices and started worshiping other gods. And so the Lord says, man, you're still in your sins. Um, so verse 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance, let us plead together, declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Boy, what a prophetic, great strength that is, that the Lord says, I'm the one who will blot out your transgressions. And not only does he blot them out, he does something that you and I could never do. And that is, he says, um, I will blot out your transgressions and I will not remember your sins. The Bible says he puts your sins as far as the east is from the west and he remembers your sins no more. You know, when I sin against you or you against me, we have this horrible thing where we just remember stuff. Isn't it crazy how your brain works? You remember the things you don't wanna remember. That, remember that goofy song that's in your head? You're like, oh, get that out of my head. I don't wanna sing that again. Uh, but it's just your brain just keeps going with that. What is that about our brain? Uh, but when somebody wrongs you, man, it's amazing how vivid your remember, remembrance of that thing that happened to you that hurts you uh, and, and then you have something you want to remember, a good Bible verse or something that was kind that somebody did for you or something good that happened and you forget all that. You only forget about the grouchy things, the evil things, the sinful things. That's human nature. Praise be to the Lord God who takes your sins and wipes them out, blots them out and remembers them no more. That's how he looks at you and says, I love you. You're, you're, look at all my sin, Lord. What sin? I put it away and I remember them no more and he declared you as righteous. And the word is justification. That's the final word in verse 26. He says, declare thou that thou mayest be justified. That's the doctrine of the New Testament, justification. Verse 27, thy first father hath sinned and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore, I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel two reproaches. Now, fortunately, the Lord's not gonna leave Israel in the place of curse and reproach, but the Lord has a plan and a purpose for the Jews still. And that we're gonna see even more of that uh, when the Lord says, I have not given up on you, Israel. He's, he's never given up on the Jews. Good news, he won't give up on you. Uh, if you hold the doctrine of you know um, where the Jews are done, God's finished with the Jews, we call that replacement theology. If you come from that view, what, what keeps the Lord from bailing out on you? Are you better than the Jews? If you look at the Jews and their history, I, I'm gonna say probably not. The Jews gave it a good shot at following the Lord and being faithful, but they failed. And I don't knock them for it, but man, they're in trouble because of that. But guess what? The Lord is faithful to them. And if the Lord bails on the Jew, why wouldn't he bail on you? The, the, the idea of replacement theology makes no sense whatsoever. Um, you and I would be in big trouble if we believe that God got frustrated with a person and said, eh, I'm not gonna keep my promise. I'm not gonna keep my everlasting covenant with you because you've, you've crossed the line. You and I, we crossed the line a long time ago. But good news, the Lord takes our sins because of Jesus and the cross, died on the cross for those sins, rose from the grave, and because of that, we have forgiveness of sin. He blots out our transgressions and he remembers our sins no more. He's gonna do that with the Jews and he's doing that with his church right now. Praise be to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, these two chapters are just great reminders of fundamental truths from your word. And I pray, Lord, for uh, those that tuned in tonight 
or we'll listen to this teaching maybe later. I pray that you just let your word penetrate our hearts and our minds. And the things that we should rejoice in, may we rejoice. The things that we need correction about, Lord, correct. Um, may the word just take root and I pray that you do a good work. So bless your people tonight as we go our way and do whatever we're gonna do the rest of the night. May your word just linger in our hearts. May we meditate on your word day and night, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.